do you think you would describe your music? Fast, loud, hard as we can make it. We be grinding, grinding, grinding up in the clubs. We be grinding, grinding, grinding up in the clubs. We be grinding, grinding, grinding up in the clubs. We be grinding, grinding, grinding up in the clubs. We be grinding, grinding, grinding up in the clubs. We be grinding, grinding, grinding up in the clubs. We be grinding, grinding, grinding up in the clubs. Have you ever seen an apple? Have you ever seen an apple walking around? I want to start by apologizing for using Weeby Grinding in the beginning of this video, but it was too iconic for me not to use, you know? <laughs> it has such an anthem energy to it. it gets me all hyped, you know? To grind. <laughs> Welcome to my very first YouTube video. I am that one quiet girl. If you've made it to this video, it's more than likely you were either an avid gardener or a fan of the garden or maybe even a hater. I fully expect fans to find this video because if you're a fan and you see a video that's titled, I hate this band, <laughs> it's very likely that you're going to click on it. I know I would. And if you're a hater, then you may or may not be disappointed with the things that I have to say. <laughs> As you can tell by the title, I hate the garden. Yeah, I hate the garden. <laughs> but not for the reason you'd think. Well, why do you hate them, Naja? Because this band has had a chokehold on me for the past year. Not a day goes by that I'm not piercing my eardrums with <laughs> This video might feel a little bit cringe like really cringe i know the fandom can be kind of gatekeepy but in my defense of the cringiness youtube has a serious lack of garden commentary and analysis especially by people that look like me so i thought hey why don't i start this channel with something that i'm genuinely obsessed with <laughs> i mean um have unbridled hatred for i didn't clickbait you i totally didn't do that <laughs> What I can say confidently without a sliver of a doubt, I have huge respect for the garden and what they stand for. Also, they're really nice to look at. The fandom is pretty horny for them. I can't deny that. More than their looks though, I really just love the way they talk about their interests and express their sense of humor in general. Of course, there are many videos of their live shows, interviews, even fan-made compilations of Fletcher and Wyatt being eccentric and rowdy brothers, but I saw maybe four five music reviews two were done none other than by the internet's busiest music nerd anthony fantano damn boy he said where he described their haha -ha album as a trashy blend of punk pop and pop punk and described their kiss my super bowl ring album as well, I think the thumbnail speaks for itself. <laughs> but no, this was actually the album that got him close to actually liking a garden record. We love to hear it. Other than Anthony though, there are a couple of reviews done by PF slash Dad Reacts, Hype Sage, and many more mainly Caucasian male music appreciators. I think it's time to break that mold. The Garden has had a profound effect on my self-confidence and motivation as an artist myself. Not only the Garden, but the members and their girlfriend's solo acts as well, including Enjoy, Puzzle, you let it in, Cowgirl Clue and LDP, who is an enigma in her own right. They don't seem to care about what people think, like, at all. Which I feel like is kind of a hard skill to acquire as an artist. You kind of, especially if you're a perfectionist, like, like me, you tend to overthink about how people will be perceiving your art. But these guys just kind of go for it. You can tell they're just very inspired people who create content that suits their taste. So I'm taking the opportunity to provide an in-depth analysis about the garden for people who are interested in what they're doing and where they came from and maybe share a different perspective. Again, I'll go more in depth about the other artists I mentioned in a few other videos I'm planning about the Vodaverse. Yes, you heard that correctly. <laughs> the Vodaverse is basically just a collection of artists that kind of subscribe to the Vada Vada philosophy or genre that Wyatt and Fletcher created the garden under. Artists like Slater, Rex, Macabre Plaza, 
Turkey recently, and the previous artist I mentioned. Since this is part one, I'll be going into the early years of the twins and their earliest music from 2010 to 2013. This will include analysis of Wyatt's Enjoy and Fletcher's Puzzle during that time, but very briefly. Just to give some context with how differently they experimented with sound separately, but come together to create something that embodies both of their sounds equally. The next two episodes will go into their more experimental works from 2014 to the present. Then. For the grand finale, the last episode will explore the fan base and the live show experience. I'll be making separate videos about Puzzle and Enjoy as well. Lord knows they deserve their own analysis and appreciation. And of course, if you're a diehard fan, please share any other facts I might have missed throughout the video or just your thoughts in general about them. And without further ado, let's dive into the goo. I don't know why I said goo, I just wanted it to rhyme. <laughs> okay, for the backstory. Wyatt and Fletcher Shears were born in 1993 Santa Ana and raised in a middle-class Orange, California. Their mother, Marcy Shears, is a hairstylist. Shears. And she's a hairstylist. That's funny. She would sometimes play alongside their father, drummer Stephen Shears, in the band Shattered in the Bond, in the band Shattered Faith and Final Conflict. And I'm Steve, I play drums. <laughs> I do believe he still plays for Shattered Faith. Imagine being a kid, not even a kid, they're like 20, they're almost 30. Imagine playing alongside your dad, who's also an artist. That's like, so amazing. As you can imagine, the twins were always exposed to punk music, amongst other genres, due to the parents' interest in them. Despite some of the music being a bit vulgar or dark and definitely not what a kid should be listening to, they can thank Steven for their early music preferences. So what record, give me, let's, let's do one last album, what's a record you have a fond memory of listening to with your dad? Definitely Prodigy Fat of the Land, or Fat Boy Slim, the one with all the records on the front. I forgot what it's called. Or Killing Joke. Oh, we've come a long way, baby. Yeah. Killing album. Joke, the album that's all orange with the clown's face on it. Yeah, uh, fire, like fire. Uh, it's the one that Dave Grohl drummed on. It's a okay, like early two thousand. Man, that's that's a good record. I remember that's going to construction record. sites with him and listening to that. That's a good one. That's a pretty heavy record. They've expressed that the fast-paced nature of the genre is what inspired them to play in that way. They've credited their early influences to bands like Discharge, The Adolescents, Aggression, JFA, or Jodie Foster's Army, and of course Minutemen. Wyatt describes his experience with this type of music at a young age in an interview with Records In My Life TV, saying his reaction would be like, what the heck is this? That used to give me goosebumps as a kid. Like I used to just get so freaking pumped up listening to that thing. I still kind of do nowadays. It's just one of those records that, as a kid. I remember when the first time I heard it, I was on my desk at home and I was just like, what the hell Yeah, is I remember this? that. We were in the same place. And yeah, we were in the same place and we were just getting so pumped up. Just like, this is like, screw every other pump band we've ever heard. This is, this is it, you know? Pumped and ready to go ham on one of the drum sets that were lying around their house, as anyone would. I find it fascinating that they were drawn to the aggression as children, but I guess it makes sense being... <laughs> Did I mention they're both self-taught? Not a single second was spent on formal training, and that honestly just leaves me speechless. It's almost unfair. Let's take a moment to talk about their supposed teenage years, or their um, high school experiences and all that. I'm going to tread lightly here as to not make any assumptions about their lives. In a few interviews, they've described their hometown as a place where you could easily stand out and just as easily not stand out. Blend in with all the other plebs. High school was like slightly weird for us. We definitely weren't friends with everybody. I feel like if you want to blend in with Orange County, you can easily blend in with Orange County. But then again, you can easily stand out in Orange County. They've always kind of walked to the beat of their own drum, wearing whatever they liked, ignoring gender conformities, and just gravitating to activities that they found interesting and engaging. This unconventional approach to the way they presented would ultimately spark a strange rumor that the boys were transgender. In a few interviews, they've talked about this. There was this rumor going around, I guess, that we turned into like full on trans. I, it was weird for us because we were, were like, why would that even matter if we were full on trains? Like, what would be the problem with that? 
According to them, their interest in wearing traditionally female clothing never stemmed from a desire to challenge social norms like some fans assume. They just, you know, like it. <laughs> Severe young men who like to wear women's pants. Women's pants. There you have it. That's it. Pretty That's much. all there is to it. I think in high school they played basketball, baseball, roller hockey, and eventually graduated to ice hockey. We play hockey every week. Ice hockey and we play roller hockey too. We played all four years of high school. Roller we played hockey. all of our lives. Yeah, yeah pretty, pretty much all We were forced life. to play roller hockey in high school because... Our we actually high weren't school. forced to play roller hockey. We were... We actually weren't forced to play hockey. We were forced to play roller hockey. We wanted to play That's ice. what I just said. We were forced to play roller hockey in high school. We couldn't play ice hockey because our team had no ice. <laughs> Why do you say it like that? <laughs> had no ice. <laughs> Hockey is evidently a huge part of their lives, even incorporating it into their music videos when they have a chance. They also dabble in a bit of modeling since their first recruitment into the Saint Laurent 2013 menswear show. They were spotted at a live show they were playing at the Echoplex, along with the band The Abigails. They didn't even know the brand despite their affinity to express themselves through clothing. They knew really nothing about luxury brands and design. What's even funnier is the fact that during that time, they were still working in a local mall and even saw their campaign photos while they worked there. Imagine walking the runway and seeing your face on posters and stuff in public, but still working at Macy's. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with Macy's. And he works at, I work at Nordstrom, he works at Macy's. And uh, basically we just switch off. Like sometimes I'll go into work at Macy's when he's working at Macy's and he'll come into Nordstrom. And for some reason, nobody even notices. So I don't know, it works out. It's just incredibly ironic, but I guess that's just how the modeling world is. As for cameos, sorry if you can hear my family, they're, they're doing their thing here. Apparently, Wyatt has done some acting in the past. It is a running joke in the fandom that Wyatt did some voice acting for the Chicken Run movie. And I don't know how true that is. Apparently, he has said this in interviews or he's talked about it a lot in the past, but I just, I couldn't find anything about it. All I could find was fans talking about it, you know, so. Bruh, if you look up the cast on Google, they don't even have a picture of Wyatt. It's a picture of Fletcher with Wyatt's name underneath the picture. It's not even him. <laughs> but other than that, he actually made an appearance in this small short film. I think it's a short film called The Art of Eating. I think he has like a whole role in this movie. Got this pumpkin too. Thought we'd carve it, roast the seeds. Look at you, so perfect. Still wanna carve the pumpkin? But I couldn't find the actual movie. Sadly, I really wanted to watch it, but according to the original poster of the clip, the movie wasn't very good. <laughs> That's not me saying it. It did not come from my mouth. I, someone just said that, so don't, don't come for me. <laughs> In terms of schooling, the boys attended Via Park High School and did just that, attended. <laughs> They've expressed time and time again that they weren't the best when it came to academics, nor were they excited or passionate about school, saying it wasn't hard, it was just very fucking boring which I'm sure we all can relate to. Ironically, they would return to the academic realm per their mother's request, attending Irving Valley College and immediately leaving. <laughs> no shame though. I admire them for continuing to do the thing that they actually wanted to do, play music and express themselves. Before the garden, there was MHV, or Miss Hannah's Victims, the Orange County kind of funk punk surf rock band consisting of Wyatt, Fletcher, and Rex, I think. Miss Hannah is actually their seventh grade orchestra teacher, as seen and heard in the live show, one of their live shows, I think that was in 2010? 2010? Yeah. She was our orchestra teacher in seventh grade. Yeah. And of course, they are not victims of anything. They, they, she didn't do anything to them, but you know. In a 2015 interview with Vice, they mentioned being in a band called S2C, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to find much information about that mu music venture. You can see an S2C sticker on Fletcher's drum set and that is the only S2C iter iterance that I have seen. If I find more stuff then I'll 
I'll just add that too. Okay, so I actually found S2C's YouTube channel under the name S2C Band. And apparently the name of the band is called Subject to Change. They have four videos on this channel and two of them are just like some, you know, funny fooling around type videos. And then two of them are of the band actually playing. One of the videos is of the song Memories of the Past. And then another one is called Gone Too Far. Check them out. It's very cool to see. Some of their work as MHV dates back from 2010 to 2012. They were about 16 to 18 years old during this time, which is incredible considering their talent. Wyatt's skills with bass are truly evident here, and I really enjoy the choruses from this band. Then they were pretty self aware about their middle class lifestyles. Uh, this song's about, uh, about how tough it is uh, growing up in Orange County, uh, living like a middle class life. Because it's difficult. Then move if you hate it so much. think that was satire. <laughs> I kind of related to the sarcastic way he said that. I mean, the name of the song is literally called Complainers, and in that song, they are talking about how their suburban counterparts are always complaining about shit that doesn't matter. You know, you can't afford on the hundred dollar pair of jeans or your daddy's being mean and you're just complaining like your life's insane. When in reality, they aren't. They're actually far from it. But who's to tell them that, you know? It's the only world they've ever lived in. But that doesn't stop the MHB crew from poking fun at these types of kids every now and then. I'm willing to bet that this is the sort of sentiment that they were sort of surrounded by in school. So of course they're going to poke fun at them. Another thing about MHV is they make it a really big point to exemplify the fact that they aren't actually a band, okay? They're not a band. MHV is just a means for their, for their personal expression. And they don't take too kindly to people who are not open to new sounds and, and are closed-minded. They also make fun of the stoners and the party goers. I bring this up later in the series, but you know. They start to sound like straight edge kids, you know, it leads me to believe that they weren't experimenting with any substances at all. They probably took pride in that because maybe, maybe they thought that, oh, people need this in order to produce the things that we are actually producing without the help of substances. I don't know. I don't know if there could be like a pride thing there. But you know how like edgy teens are, they want to be different, they want to be different from the crowd. In suburbia, one of the biggest things that kids try to overcome is the fear of being mundane, the fear of being basic. <laughs> Anywho, around 2011, they decided they worked best together as a sibling duo. Wyatt and Fletcher would branch off into their own projects, including, of course, The Garden and Wyatt's Enjoy. 2012 would mark the birth of Fletcher's Puzzle. I find it incredible how many projects they had going on in tandem. Like, they, they just, you know, would just make music and then just put that under one name and put this under another name and then it's just like an overflowing well of just music, expression, whatever they want to call 
whatever it is they're doing. But one thing I do like is that they're all kind of unique in their own right. I'm sure many fans are aware of the origin of the name The Garden, but for those who aren't, according to the twins, The Garden was a sort of nothing name, a placeholder for a more thought out name in the future. However, the name ended up sticking and eventually they would attribute this name to their ever growing sound. Just pretty much off whim, but now it just kind of like relates to like a like just growing, you know, in general, like as like a as musicians and as a band, and <clears throat> you know, just as like a garden would grow. You know. And I'm happy they decided to keep it. Most of their early work was distributed by Burger Records. Psst, we hate Burger Records in this house. I'll explain when we get to the 2020 timeline. But later, music would be distributed under Epitaph Records. Before Burger, though, the Garden would release a self-titled cassette, a split cassette in 2011, which was apparently their first digital release, sharing space with a band called River. Kind of an interesting play on words with the Garden and the River, like it kind of works. Hiya! Just interjecting here literally a year later to say that I have taken the time to scour their old socials, and mainly Facebook because that, that has the most posts. And I have to say, there are quite a few singles that were released before this tape with the river. Sadly, a lot of these old links to Mediafire and Bandpage with their old music before Bandcamp and SoundCloud do not work anymore. Even most of the Bandcamp and SoundCloud releases aren't available either. There's a lot of lost media that honestly, I would fight anyone or anything to have access to these files. Not only music, but apparently there was a music video for the song Goose Egg, which appears on the Life and Times of a Paperclip album, which I guess was released as a single along with Vada Vada. You can imagine my disappointment when the link to that gem didn't work either. Finding all of this is really bittersweet. Like it's cool to have knowledge of it, but without the music, I feel like there's a huge piece missing to the garden lore. At least we have Quick and Fear still. I was happy to be able to listen to those. And Steak. Can't forget Steak. Check them out. Wyatt, Fletcher, if you somehow come across this video, please let us know why you haven't released these again. Though I feel like it has a lot to do with the record company that these were released under. But yeah, I'm just curious to know. And I'm sure your growing fan base is too. Thought I was gonna sneeze. Here you can definitely hear the Minutemen influences. Here's a quick comparison. I try to work and I keep thinking of World War III! Music takes center stage while the lyrics feel like they're being punched through. They tick all the boxes for me on this release. There are fast paced moments with silk, unique disjointed scores like in fantasies. Lyrics are minimal and abstract. I love the outburst because it feels like the music is literally being pushed out of them like they're pushing it. <coughs> I mean they literally have a song called Hollering. I'll leave you to guess the lyrical genius of this track. <laughs> absolute artistry. Going into Enjoy, music in its early days focused on bass riffs and minimal drums. The track Let's Not Talk About Love is a perfect example of this. And oh my god, this is the perfect time to address the elephant in the room. Wyatt's voice is something. <laughs> Let's not talk about I 
obviously it wasn't insanely terrible. It was just the higher octaves that got me every time. In later releases, you can tell he's kind of figured out what styles of vocalization fit his voice. The range is still up in the air, but he's leaning into the more deeper, more sultry sound with some poppy rap as well. I'm a huge fan of the rap. I mean, I feel like I'm giving too much to people that couldn't give to fucks about me is an instant classic for people pleasers. I would know. As of recently, he's branched more into pop synth in addition to funky jazz-like bass and drums that are so danceable. I mean, you'd have to be a robot to not dance to freaking It's all about getting that sleep settle back on track. <laughs> His first ever self-release project was an EP called Hands and Feet in August of 2011. This project focused on Wyatt's voice and his bass guitar sound. It isn't until his second independent release, Morning Sky, which was released in November of that year, that we hear drums make an appearance. There's just something about his compositions that give me life. They're full of emotion and are playful in some areas, yet fast and intentional with their delivery. <laughs> With this, we get a taste of the sound he wanted to develop in his own world. Very romantic, very heartfelt, and almost indulgent. It's a shame the means of listening to these projects is very slim. There are more projects lost due to Wyatt's severance with Burger Records. Puzzle only had one demo out with about three songs in 2012, released in December on the 21st. This demo was a taste of what Fletcher was interested in developing musically. Moody synths, electronic bass, and drums, of course, quite in contrast to the traditional bass and romantic compositions of Enjoy. Of lyricism and overall intentions with these projects, Wyatt and Fletcher both explained in a 2015 interview with Interview Magazine, who named it that? What the hell? That these projects show, quote, a more romantic side of themselves as far as relationships and personal feelings, and it definitely sounds like it. At this time, The Garden's 2012 EP called Tape or self-titled as The Garden on Spotify, was released supposedly on May 15th of that year on Bandcamp, and their album Everything is Perfect was released December 19th of that year on the same platform and on Spotify. Before I get into the technicalities of these projects, I just want to clarify that a lot of these dates are kind of conflicting due to release dates through Burger or like some other reason. I don't even know why. So the tape EP on Spotify actually has its release date set to 2013 under the title The Garden, but with the same album art, though the one on Bandcamp is a little bit greener and not squished like the one on Spotify. Anyway, going back to the twins and their strengths, when they came together to create The Garden's first EP, they knew exactly how to play into them. I do believe Wyatt was mainly on bass and main vocals and Fletcher on drums. The EP, though housing some incredibly short tracks, did what it was meant to do, to set the groundwork for what they wanted their sound to be, early in the game at least. Each track has its own personality, showing only a glimpse into the world of Vada Vada. These short songs were kind of like, they were short but very impactful. My personal favorite is The Plantation, don't say it, I know how that sounds. <laughs> the beat is just so infectious, it makes me want to break into a intense praise dance. <laughs> It's 
hard to pick a favorite though because again the songs are so short they only give a small idea of what a three minute track could be regrettably there aren't a lot of interviews with the boys during this time i could only find like a few live shows so this means we'll have to do some interpreting ourselves when it comes to the lyrics in later interviews though fletcher and wyatt explained that making shorter songs was something they enjoyed at the time it was comfortable and probably allowed them to experiment more with sound rather than focusing on making a long song or just like a standard length song let's go briefly into the lyricism of this ep <laughs> lyrics almost seem like a stream of consciousness part of me is like okay this is clearly their version of shit posting but what if there was some deeper meaning to a gorilla beating the shit out of you <laughs> The first song, The Gorilla, is a 1 minute and 12 second song and the lyrics are merely, I'm ready for you to beat the shit out of me. I'm ready for you to teach me a lesson, Gorilla. Now on the surface, one could say this is just an abstract illustration. Maybe they saw an angry gorilla on TV or on the internet and imagined themselves being beaten up by it. <laughs> For some reason, this reminds me of a short commentary they did about their track, I'll Stop By Tomorrow Night. There, they described a local gang that went to their high school that would initiate new members by literally beating the shit out of them. <laughs> when we were in high school, there was like this big group of kids and a lot of the kids wanted, they were, I think they were part of, I don't know what they were part of, but like a lot of kids wanted to be a part of that group. And I remember specifically one time there was, you know, in order to be a part of that group, the whole group like beat the shit out of one kid and then left they him tasered on, him. and tasered yeah. him and like left him on the street. And they were, all these kids went to our high school, so of course you heard about it. And like the kids showed up all beat up the other day, but it's like, oh, he's a part of the group now. I guess. In The Gorilla, it almost seems like the narrative is from a new member's perspective, with the gang being symbolized as the gorilla. Most likely a reach, but who knows. The only other songs with lyrics on this EP are The Tractor and The Mantis, which are equally funny, dare I say even more, than The Gorilla. The Tractor sounds like what being in a state of intense focus sounds like. The lyrics are very simple. I'm in my element, tractor, twice, I'm in my element, Tractor. I say twice, but they say it a lot in that song. <laughs> so dumb but so catchy. I get this image of a man mowing his lawn with great confidence. <laughs> He's in his element. Now, the mantis. I just have to say, the pace of this track is crazy. Genius has what I hope are the actual lyrics. They read, I am the mantis. I am the mantis and I wear my high heels. Twice, like the last songs. The best thing I could have ever done was look up a dancing mantis in hopes I'd find one dancing in perfect sync with this song. Which of course I did, so you're welcome. Moving on to their third release, Everything is Perfect. Actually, there was a project released before Everything is Perfect, but under the name Vada Vada instead of The Garden. This collection of 12 tracks are all instrumental. It honestly sounds more like a soundtrack than an album. A soundtrack to like a horror, sci-fi, mysterious, I don't know, something like a- it, it kind of reminds me of like the vibe of It Follows, if you've seen that movie before. There's just something about it that's just ominous. Okay, back to Everything is Perfect. Here we actually see track lengths from about half a minute to a minute and 40 seconds. Wow. Wow, they really went off on this one. This project sounds like a wild ride through the gutters. The bass riffs and melodies are so creepy, but satisfying. Like with the sludgy intro song, Aunt J. is Aunt J. This song melts into the track Estamos Aki or We Are Here, which feels like the background music to an intense bar fight. <laughs> By the way, I loved, loved, loved the early performances of this song. The faces are everything. <laughs> the next 
next couple of songs are Rainbow and Fix. Rainbow is so simple, from the anatomy of the song to the lyrics themselves. The broken chord progression in the beginning of the song mirrors the riff played before the start of the lyrics. It's just slow and then quick. Do, 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 do. <laughs> The same pattern appears in Fix, but the notes are just different. I really have to say, these are progressions that I've never heard before. Maybe I'm just not that well versed in music, but having experienced these newish sounds for the first time, I was completely enamored with the pacing and the choice of harmonies. I found myself craving more of this unique sound. In terms of lyrics, they're pretty straightforward and vague at the same time. Rainbow's lyrics go, I'm so happy, in my place. Look at the rainbow, across my face. This place could be anywhere. The rainbow could also be anything. What do rainbows usually symbolize? In Christian faith, they symbolize hope, but they don't really strike me as the religious type. Also, I don't think it's very fair to place any inference on the LGBTQ plus identification since there is no evidence about their identities in that regard. However, in psychology, rainbows signify joy, creativity, and positivity. My instinct is to say they mean joy here. Look at the joy across my face face. That makes so much sense to me. Fix's lyrics are probably the first time we're seeing an introspective moment from whichever twin wrote the song. They read, I want to fix it, want to fix it, but I'm not helping me. I want to fix, I want to fix it. Why can't I see? Someone wants to fix something, but they're not helping themselves do that. They internally ask themselves why they can't see that fact. I love the way the song starts with a ghoulish tone, starting us off with a spooky two-note synth. Then they build on that with an iconic bass riff. Another haunting chord progression, and then comes in the drums around the 23 second mark, adding more beats and a spacious cymbal beat as time goes on. The next song with lyrics is Mask, but first we get Spirit Chant, which is exactly what you would expect it to be. Now, I know it's probably not my place to speak on this, but I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that they're doing the Tom and Jerry ass Native American stereotypical like hand chant when they performed this live. <laughs> and I'm not sure how to feel about it. <laughs> I know this action is rooted in harmful stereotypes, but I'm also not one to crucify somebody for doing something that is clearly without malicious intent. Just a lapse in judgment, maybe? Let me know how y'all feel about this. Moving on, we have the song Mask, with the lyrics being, wear the mask upon your face, covering up disgrace. And that's it. Again, straightforward, but fake. Who's wearing the mask? Are they disgraceful and that's why they wear it? I wonder who was in mind when they wrote this. Express Sector 28 has very understandable lyrics and there's no way anyone would ever mishear them. <laughs> I'm not a music expert, so I don't really know how to explain the unsettling keys they like to play in, but I love how it immerses me into this grimy world of dirt, anger, and angst. But weirdly, the album titled song gives off vibes that are like exactly the opposite. It feels happy and like everything's perfect, bruh, but with a layer of irony draped over it. <laughs> sounds like a goofy alternate universe cowboy theme song and the last song on the project is a painfully slow yet beautiful ballad called rights the lyrics are literally just oh i have rights <laughs> which i mean yeah you do probably more than others this one feels kind of ironic too not gonna lie before i give myself a headache let's get into 2013 baby for real this time now this may be a little bit controversial but the life and times of a paperclip era is my favorite garden era and it completely has everything to do with the stylistic decision of wearing matching turtlenecks to confuse people as exhibited on the album art, which I fucking adore. This album art has the Beavis and Butthead energy that the last one had, but a little bit more refined. I love that title font. I'm a sucker for a good illustrated logo. That and Fletcher's drumming is 
godlike on this project. Again, with the fast compositions, the apple, vada vada, goose egg, I'm a woman, and so many others, they all have such an intoxicating speed to them. If it doesn't make you want to flail around, is it even music? <laughs> I have no idea what they put into these songs, but whatever it was, it adds a little something that just itches my brain in the right, just the, mm, right in the crevices. Every single one of these songs has a melody that I've never heard before. I can't get enough of it. All of it is relatively still traditional and instruments, but I noticed a hint of synth usage in the tracks Charlie and Bird's Nest. <laughs> successful integration I'd say. They weren't too jarring, adding just enough experimental flavor not to upset the punk puritans. Okay so the first song we have on this album is called Trust. <laughs> And the beautiful lyrics to this song are <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> There was one vocalization for this song and that was it but it still I think contributes a lot to the track And next up we have The Apple Have you ever seen an apple? And I'm sure you can imagine what this one is about. <laughs> I, the one thing I like about this album is that um, the theme of the song is obviously the title, but the, the lyrics are very literal. Some of them are personified inanimate objects that feels like, you know, you're getting a glimpse into what the life is like of that thing. So like here in the apple, the lyrics are, have you ever seen an apple? Have you ever seen an apple walking around? Because I sure haven't. <laughs> that wasn't the lyric. That was just me saying that <laughs> and they repeat this about like four times again it's just it works with the song it's very simple but it's just it's still so fun to listen to and the fact that the, the lyrics are so like not like that introspective it just lends itself to what the song feels like rather than like what the song means which i love and of course next we have vada vada <laughs> They have created like this like theme song for the genre and presumably for the garden in general. The lyrics are just I wanna do the vada vada vada, let's do the vada 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 like it's just it's so silly and like nonsensical seeming but it's so like I love it. I don't know why I love it so much. And then of course the next song we have is called Interrupt. This one has some like playful lyrics, I think. It's like building a narrative, you know? So expressing what someone would say during an argument when someone is interrupting them. So the, the lyrics go, wait, just don't speak. Just don't speak, you cut me off. Wait, just let me speak. Just let me speak, you cut me off. And this is, you know, this is said twice. This one I feel to, <laughs> I've had some experiences where I've been in an argument and I'm just like, this person keeps cutting me off and I can't even get like a thought out and it's so frustrating. frustrating. One thing I wanted to note about this song in general though, like the whole vibe of it feels very butter tones. If you know the butter tones, like they're more of like a, indie beach rock type of vibe as well the way the song like kind of like has this jump to it like a duh, 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 like that i feel like the butter tones do that a lot so that's what that reminded me of and i really enjoyed the jumpiness and the abruptness of this song okay so the next song is there is a moth in here oh, I see a moth and he's looking at me. And this, I can just imagine, I don't know which twin like wrote this song, but I could just imagine that they, they, they were looking around the room to find a subject to write something about and they just see a moth. And then they write, I see a moth and he's looking at me. I see a moth and he's looking at me. Like, yes, yes. <laughs> whoa, oh, 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 oh. I apologize to you. Oh, 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 oh. The next one is called Life as a Hanger, and this one is, that's another narrative about what it's like to be a hanger, you know? It's its literally like a tiny story. It, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of like, mm, where the sidewalk ends. 
that book by Shel Silverstein, that book is like a f- is full of like little stories, and that that is what that's the vibe that I'm getting from this album because every single song is like just a moment, and some of them are stories that feel like those stories that would be in that book. And like I said, the lyrics were "Life as a hanger, bending backwards, heavy clothing." bending my shoulders that that is just like i don't think you understand like the sheer genius of that (laughs) i'm not hearing songs nowadays that are just about mundane things like i don't know it just feels like so unique and i love it I i felt like the clothing was like a metaphor for life and like you know we always have to carry life on our shoulders and it and it bends us backwards you know <laughs> okay so the next song is the life and times of the paperclip which of course is the name of the album this doesn't have any lyrics but i i just need to talk about how pumped this song gets me literally <laughs> So the next song is called What We Are. In this song, the lyrics go, let's review this topic about death and art. Oh, we're in a big circle. I want to restart. Technology is my master. Don't let me kill myself. Over 80 years later, I want to restart. This is going to take me a while to like articulate and you know the the drink is not helping but (laughs) so okay let's review this topic about death and art death and art if you experience a death that could inspire art they could also be saying that art is somewhat dead in this modern society but also the lyric after it oh we're in a big circle i want to restart and one thing that they do talk about a lot in interviews is that they try their best not to look to past artists when they're making art this is how i'm kind of interpreting this lyric about them wanting to kind of restart some or or start something new instead of looking back to all these older artists like just doing something new oh we're in a big circle nothing really excuse me i can't my brain is moving faster than my mouth art repeats itself just like history repeats itself it's like how like mundane art has become and how like reproduced it has become they kind of feel like it's a big circle which it kind of is and of course they want to restart that they want to restart the wheel they want to go in a direction that no one has gone before technology is my master don't let me kill myself that is relevant we use tech every day we and we try our best to not let it like control us or to like take over our lives lest we be killed by technology i think we all can agree with that so i'm gonna leave that at that over 80 years later I want to restart. I interpret that as you dedicate your life to technology or you are so obsessed with technology that you wasted your life on it and never went outside. <laughs> so that's that's like the only thing I can think of. Remember when I said... <laughs> okay, okay, life as a hanger. That song is beneath grass and grass is the next song we're going to talk about. <laughs> And I only say this because Grass is a song that I actually do frequently play a lot because of just the energy. Again, the energy is wild. The lyrics are just, they're so minimal. Mowed on, stepped on, pissed on. Mowed on, stepped on, pissed on. Life can be hard for a blade of grass. And that is just genius. And I don't care what anybody else says, it's genius. But it's the way, it's not just the lyrics, it's the delivery. It's it's the mowed on stepped on pissed on and then twice at that matter like saying it twice while screaming it's like actual frustration it's like he is the blade of grass and he is sick and tired of being mowed on stepped on and pissed on and yeah life can be hard for a blade of grass every time it tries to go grow higher it's just fucking mowed on by the guy with the damn tractor. <laughs> Next song is eight foot tall man walking out of the forest and the lyrics are just that. I see an eight foot tall man. He's walking out of the forest. And this song just sonically is really fun. It does that stop and start thing again. It's like dun dun dun. 
like I love that I love oh it just makes my body feel it just makes my body want to move you know I don't know what it is about those parts that like are just so fun and experimental and full of life that it just makes my heart happy <laughs> next song is gumdrops and it's just as sweet as you think it'd be I love you. the lyrics are I love you and you love me lollipops and gumdrops make us happy lollipops do kind of make me happy it kind of sounds like Barney but like edgy <laughs> Charlie's fun the only lyrics to this song are Charlie oh Charlie the song is it's another song that's just like um musically it's engaging and it's fun and it's definitely one that is meant to be like to get the mosh pit like riled up you know okay so the next song is called goose egg and i did some research about like what a goose egg actually could symbolize and the google dictionary basically says a goose egg is like a zero score in a game if a goose egg actually means that then he's saying that he has it or he sees it he spies it i see a goose egg i spy a goose egg ha it could mean that you know he sees a zero point game for the person he's singing to you know like maybe they're about to fight and it does kind of sound like like a fight's about to happen especially like towards the end where like the drum is just like <laughs> The drums are just like so fucking fast and it sounds like a collision is about to happen. Okay, so the next one is Bird's Nest and the lyrics are just, I'm waking up in a bird's nest and he says that four times and I'm not sure what that means. I know bird's nest could be like synonymous with your home, your, your, your personal home, the one you grew up in, the one you were nested in. So maybe, you know, they're waking up in a bird's nest, the, they're waking up at their mom's house, like, <laughs> which would be accurate because I think, I do believe during the time of this album release, they were living with their mom or still living at their parents' house in their rooms and uh, surrounded by all of their inspiring things. The next song is I'm a Woman. Yeah, yeah, I'm a woman. One of the most popular songs on this album, mainly because of the music video that they've released with it. So actually, let me pull that up because we can watch that together and react to it together. Here we go. As you can see, Fletcher is dressed up as a woman. He actually looks really great. The lipstick is a little struggle buzz and it makes his smile look like like crazy. <laughs> the faces that Fletcher is making, he's like, like he's so, like he's so spazzy. I love it. He's dressed up as a woman and they are walking around wherever they're walking around. Bus station, a church, a woman's club. That's funny. So yeah, it's just like them walking forward. They're just literally walking forward the entire time. What is, what's weird is like, why do they wake up and they're on a dingy mattress. I don't know whose mattress that is, but that's disgusting. <laughs> Something about this song too, the way that- I don't know who's exactly singing. I know Wyatt is singing in the video, but I don't know if like he was actually the vocals that were recorded. I like the effect that they put on the voice because it sounds kind of like cartoony, which is basically like the vibe of this entire album. Again, energy. Energy is- the energy is just immaculate. I like how- <laughs> I like how Fletcher is just like- he like covers himself. The lyrics to this song are, I am a woman, come pick me up. I have no legs and I am stuck. I have no idea what that means. If it kind of sounds like it could be a social commentary, but I don't want to like make any wrong guesses and like potentially offend the creators of this song. So I'm not going to say anything that's like crazy. I do think that maybe this wasn't intended to be read too into because like because what could it possibly mean it, it like so she's stuck because she doesn't have any legs but why doesn't why doesn't she have legs i'll leave y'all to decide let me know what you think in the comments because i don't know i don't want to make any assumptions because it sounds kind of like like they're trying to rile some feathers up but i'm not gonna say anything <laughs> okay so that brings me to the rocket the very last song on this album it's very like happy-go-lucky when i think of rockets for some reason i'm thinking of i don't know why but 
I think of a rocket and I think about the tone of this song and it kind of makes me feel like kind of retro like maybe they're watching a rocket go up the very first rocket to go into space and it's like that the vibes were crazy back then when you see this huge vehicle going up into space literally to the moon like that but yeah overall good energy on this song i really like it and of course like the whistling at the end it's very like vibey though little did we know they'd soon be pushing the envelope with The Garden's 2013 EP called Rules was released by Japan's Big Love Records on August 12th, then made available on Bandcamp on the 30th of that month. This marks the official turning point for the Garden's sound, as they begin this project with a sonically interesting trap beat and freaky raps with heavy reverb. Get Me My Blade is just all around a good time, and every time I listen to it, I just feel like I'm about to square up with some ragamuffins or something like that. Then right after, we have Make This A Challenge slash We Like You. What's fun about this track is that the two sentiments in the title mirror the progression of the song. It starts with a roaring, pit-starting bass riff, and when Fletcher storms in with powerful drums, they add to the intense buildup until it gracefully falls off at the 37 second mark, and crescendos into a slow jam with heavenly vocalizations from Wyatt, I assume. The beginning of the song sounds like a challenge being prompted, and then the end sounds like the resolution of, hey, we like you. <laughs> Let us play you a smooth lick and serenade you into submission. Dramatic? Yes, but I love it. Spirit Chant and Estamos Aki make another appearance. Then we hear a new tune called Go Outside and Play. I enjoy the composition of this one. It's simple, but it takes those playful turns that I really enjoy. It reminds me of that episode of Spongebob when Plankton is like controlling Spongebob's mind to get the Krabby Patty formula, and that ominous surf rock song comes on. You know the one. You know it. <laughs> I, I feel a little funny today. Adore it. 10 out of 10. Then we have Circles, an undeniable Vada Vada classic. We're the garden, and this song's called Circles. This one has more of an elaborate soundscape that is interesting and really enjoyable to listen to. I like the way the synths overlap and sort of fall into each other in a calculated way. The weird beat is so fun, like everything about this project is just weird and experimental and just pure fun. Around this time they did an interview with Pennyback TV stating that the Blue Man Group was a huge source of inspiration for the Garden sound exploration. Which is so fucking valid, I love them for that. I love them even more for that. Biggest uh, musical influences? Um, probably Blue Man Group. Uh, uh, George Washington. Carter? It's just George Washington. <laughs> At the end of 2013, in late October, The Garden plugs a Vada Vada project called Question Mark with Ashley Calhoun. You may also know her as Cowgirl Clue, or if you're a longtime fan, DJ Genie Factory on SoundCloud. I'm really excited to do a video about her. She's an amazing DJ. This album is 10 tracks of world building sound. World. <laughs> that's so hard to say world building soundscapes full of heavy bass drums and electro elements lots of distortion little to no lyrics with exceptions to quicksand and the weird riddle in track four still a fun time all around i found myself just putting this on in the background while i work something i want to bring up too is the vada vada videos on the vada vada youtube channel featuring weird scenarios with eccentric characters and members of the collective these videos were posted between 2013 and 2017 and as i've said before referring to the garden self-titled ep these were just glimpses of the world of Vada Vada. Very small glimpses, but they leave me wanting more. Like, they're just so obscure. They're so, like, abstract. We don't know the lore in these worlds and in these videos. It's just all, like, what's the word? Like, lost media type stuff? One was filmed, like, just a short 
introductory to a short film it was just like it posed the situation and it just like didn't resolve itself <laughs> and then there was one with just an interview with a guy uh, or girl who who knows just a creature i don't know i'm gonna put clips in here just so you can get a glimpse of what that stuff is like because i feel like i i know that like diehard fans would know about this youtube channel and like these videos <laughs> Hey, thanks a lot. Hey, wh where are we going? Uh, the happiest I've ever been it was probably summer of 93. Trina just graduated ITT Tech. I'm proud of my baby girl. We spent two months that summer out in Cape Cod. Shane got into a bit of a sea do accident. They've tried the glitch, but because they don't understand the glitch, uh, it just doesn't really work. I can show you. It's about to happen. Here comes the train. XC9. I get the stitches out, I'm gonna be able to glitch uh, much more effectively. The glitch really takes a lot out of me. Burns on my lower back. Ah! Ah! The amount of world building that's gone into this collective is just really interesting and I just want to just learn more about it and just share it because I feel like a lot of work goes into doing stuff like that and like it's entertaining. In addition to that, just seeing these videos makes me really nostalgic because when I was in high school, I used to have this friend group of guys and they would all just do stuff like that. They would just film videos I have them in the same audio video class and I always wanted to like be a part of that crew just because like even though they were dorky they were still like I thought it was cool what they were doing you know they even made a few videos for their own YouTube channel like I didn't know how to integrate myself into that but I've always wanted to be a part of it and with that that brings us to 2014, which we'll get into in the next video. Join me next time on this journey through the Garden's discography. We'll look into the most highly acclaimed albums, EPs, tapes, and eventually dive into their most recent experimental works. If you didn't hate this video, let me know. Give me a like if you liked it and want to see more, or don't if you don't. Throw a rat emoji in the comments if you made it to the end of the video and let me know your thoughts so far. Let me know if you're a veteran fan or a fairly new fan and I hope to see you next time but until then. Good clock, uh.